Before our break, we covered these six addressing modes. Let's quickly review the function of each mode. Mode zero provides immediate access to an operand since it's already stored in one of the processor's general purpose registers. If an operand is stored outside the CPU, for example in memory, we can use mode one to address the operand. Addressing modes two and four can be used if we're working with lists or tables of operands that are stored in consecutive locations. On the other hand, if a list of operands is not stored in consecutive locations, we can select addressing modes three or five. Earlier, our programmer used the auto increment mode to step through a table of operands. Now he's confronted with a different situation. He wants to access just one entry in the table. Is there an addressing mode that allows our programmer to go directly to any entry in his table? Yes, there is. It's called the index mode, or more simply, addressing mode six. Here's how the index mode works. We can use a starting address to define the location of our table of operands. Note that this starting address always directs us to the first entry in the table. Then, to get to any other entry in the table, we use a displacement value. This displacement value defines the location of each entry relative to the table's starting address. For example, to locate the fourth word entry, we use a displacement of plus six, or to locate the first word entry, we use a displacement of zero. Thus, the address of any operand stored in a table can be specified by two components, the starting address of the table and the displacement of the operand relative to this starting address. Notice that in this example, the starting address is a fixed value, whereas the displacement is variable. There's another name for the starting address and the displacement. Here, the fixed starting address is referred to as the base, the variable displacement is then called the index. Consequently, to address any operand in this table, we simply add the base address to the appropriate index value. In some of the earlier addressing modes, we stored the address of an operand in one of our GPRs. However, now our operand address is calculated from two components. Where do we store these two address components? Well, the base, or starting address of the table, can be stored in one of the general purpose registers. Here, we've stored the base address in register R2. That takes care of the base. Now, where's the index word located? Well, the index, or displacement of an entry relative to the base, can be stored in the first word location that follows the instruction. Here, we have an instruction that calls for the index mode. When this instruction is retrieved and decoded, the PC is incremented by two. The new value, PC plus two, is the address of a memory location containing the index word. Thus, we've located our operand by summing a base address stored in R2 with an index word that follows the current instruction. We use this symbol to designate the index mode of addressing. In both examples, the operand's address is determined by adding an index value of 30 to the base address of 500. Note that the locations of the base and index values can be reversed. In the top example, R2 contains the base, and the index word follows the clear instruction. In the second example, the index word appears in R2, and the base follows the instruction. Before going any further, let's step through an example that illustrates the use of the index mode. In our example, we're going to increment specific values that are stored in this table. We've already stored the starting address of the table in register R5. Now we'll use the index mode to address specific values contained in the table. This instruction increments the second entry in the table. Access to this entry is accomplished by adding an index of two to the starting address contained in R5. Here again, we're using the index mode to address an operand. However, this time, the index value of 14 directs us to the last entry in the table. Now, we're incrementing the fifth entry in our table. 
To address this operand, we've specified an index value of 10. Finally, we issue this instruction in order to increment the third entry in our table. The address of this entry is formed by summing the index of plus four with the table's starting address contained in R5. We've now covered one possible use of the index mode. It allows us to address any entry in a table simply by specifying the location of that entry relative to a starting address. Now, suppose we're working with several tables and we need to update the second entry in each table. Once again, we can use the index mode to locate our operands. Let's see how this is accomplished. The address of any entry in tables A, B, and C can be broken down into two components. First of all, we use a starting address to define the location of each table. Then we use a displacement value to define the location of any entry relative to that table's starting address. For example, to locate the second entry in these tables, we use a displacement of plus two. Notice that our starting address is not fixed. It's different for each table. Therefore, the starting address of these tables now becomes our variable component. We'll treat this variable starting address as our index word. In this case, we're interested in the second entry in tables A, B, and C. The displacement of that entry does not vary. Its value is plus two for all three tables. Because our displacement is now a constant, we'll refer to it as the base. Hence, to address the second entry in any of these tables, we sum the base value of plus two with the appropriate starting address or index. This is another variation of the index addressing mode. Let's go through an example to illustrate this variation. The processor enters the index addressing mode whenever a six appears in the mode field of an instruction. This instruction happens to call for a clear operation. When our clear instruction is retrieved, the PC is automatically incremented. The new value, PC plus two, then directs the processor to a memory location that contains our index word. As we've noted earlier, this index word corresponds to the starting address of table A, B, or C. In this example, we wish to clear the second entry in all three tables. Note that we've already stored a base value of plus two in general purpose register R0. This base value defines the location of the second entry relative to each table's starting address. For example, here the CPU responds to our clear instruction by adding the index of 700 to the base that's stored in register R0. This produces an effective address of 702. This effective address directs the processor to the second entry in table C. On the other hand, if we wish to clear the second entry in table A, we issue this instruction. Note that the base value in R0 has not changed. The only change occurs in the index or starting address, which is now 500. This last instruction tells the CPU to clear the second entry in table B. Thus, we've used the index mode to locate the second entry in all three tables. This was accomplished by changing the index word representing the starting address of table A, B, or C. That concludes our discussion of the index mode. We've now covered seven of our eight basic addressing modes. The last mode we covered, the index mode, calculates the operand's address from two components, a base value and an index word. There's also a deferred form of the index mode. This is the last of our eight basic addressing modes. Let's quickly compare the index and index deferred modes. As we already noted, when an instruction calls for the index mode, the processor takes the base value and adds it to an index word. This produces an effective address of the operand. In this example, the base is stored in a GPR and the index word follows the instruction. When index deferred is used, the base value is again summed with an index word. However, the result is a pointer to an address rather than the actual address. In other words, the pointer is first used to locate the address. Once the CPU retrieves this address, it can then be used to fetch the desired operand. 
We use this notation to designate the index deferred mode. The at symbol indicates that this is a deferred addressing mode. The letter X represents our index word or base address that is added to the value contained in register R sub N. Since this is a deferred mode, the result produces a pointer instead of an address. That completes our discussion of the eight basic addressing modes. Before we go on to our next major topic, let's review the function of each of these addressing modes. When this review is finished, we're going to ask you to complete some exercises contained in your workbook. The first two addressing modes we covered were called register and register deferred. Recall that the register mode is the only case where the operand is stored right in the CPU. In other words, the instruction directs the processor to a general purpose register that contains the operand. If an operand is stored outside the processor, we can use the register deferred mode. In this case, an address is stored in the GPR designated by the instruction. This address directs the processor to an operand located either in memory or in an I.O. register. These are the symbols we use to designate addressing modes 0 and 1. Notice that there are two different ways of representing mode 1. We can prefix the register R sub N with an at sign, or we can place parentheses around register R sub N. Either symbol denotes the register deferred mode. Often we're dealing with a series of operands rather than just one operand. In these situations, we can use the auto increment or auto decrement modes. Note the major differences between these two addressing modes. With auto increment, we increment the address stored in the GPR after it is used to locate each operand. On the other hand, with auto decrement, we decrement the address before retrieving an operand. Remember, if we're working with bytes, we increment or decrement by one. If we're dealing with words, we always increment or decrement by two. If we happen to be using the auto increment or auto decrement modes, we use these symbols. In both cases, the parentheses indicate the register contains the address of an operand. By the way, notice where we've placed the plus and minus signs. The plus sign always follows the parenthesis since we auto increment the address after fetching the operand. Conversely, with auto decrement, the minus sign precedes the parenthesis because we decrement the address before retrieving an operand. There are also deferred forms of the auto increment and auto decrement modes. In these deferred modes, we increment or decrement a pointer to an address rather than the address itself. By the way, whenever you're using these deferred modes, the pointer is always incremented or decremented by two and never by one. The deferred forms of auto increment and auto decrement are represented by these symbols. Notice the similarity between these symbols and the symbols that we used for auto increment and auto decrement. The only change involves the at symbol, which denotes we are operating in a deferred addressing mode. Index and index deferred were the last two addressing modes we discussed. Both of these modes sum a base address with an index word. If the index mode is chosen, this produces an address of our operand. Index deferred, on the other hand, produces a pointer to the address. This address, in turn, directs the processor to the actual operand. We must use this notation whenever we're calling for the index mode or the index deferred mode. Remember, the letter X represents an index word or base address that is summed with the contents of register R sub N. The value represented by the letter X can be either positive or negative. We've now described the symbols that are used for all eight addressing modes. The equivalent binary codes are shown here. These binary codes form bits three, four, and five of our 16-bit instruction word. By the way, notice that bit 3 defines whether we're using a deferred addressing mode or a direct addressing mode. A binary 0 denotes a direct addressing mode. A binary 1 designates a deferred mode. That wraps up our discussion of these eight basic addressing modes. Before going any further, we'd like you to complete a series of exercises contained in your workbook. 
These exercises are very important and should reinforce your understanding of all eight addressing modes. Please do not begin any new material until you have finished the exercises and checked your responses against the answer sheets provided in the workbook. When you hear the next tone, turn off this playback unit and proceed to the workbook exercises. After you've completed these exercises, you can continue with this study unit.